on our flow sheet. <coughs> what comes after axis? All right. It is imperative that before you even start to look for your MI, because this is where all the mistakes get made in the field, you have to look at intervals. We went through intervals our first day by talking about what should be a normal PRI. On a lot of these EKGs, they're written in milliseconds. So it's their three digits. So if you have a, um, may I borrow this for one second? If you have your PRI is 208, that means your PRI is 0 0.20, almost 0 0.21. If you have a QRS that is um, 90, <coughs> then your QRS is 0 0.09. There has to be three numbers there. So, uh, and the decimal comes in the beginning. So generally three digits, it's dot, whatever the next two are. If there's only two numbers, you've got to add a zero. So we have to look at our intervals for a reason. So what I want you to do is take a look at your intervals. And on the top of the page, after looking at your intervals, just put a check mark in the corner that says all intervals are normal. Or actually, maybe we'll do this. If you find an interval that is not normal, what follows this here is the interval. So for instance, I have, if you have something that's got a PRI 0.21, what does that tell you? So I follow with a normal axis and I've got a first degree AV block with PRI 201. That's how you write it, so that they know why you know it's a first degree. So now go through your, the ones you've already done and look at your intervals. If you have a normal PRI, no big deal, a normal QRS, and a normal QTC, then you write normal intervals right after. Okay. If you have a prolonged QTC, you put a prolonged QTC at 568. See, whatever's out of whack, you write on your interpretation after your original words. I'm trying to teach you how to write at the same time as read so it goes on your run report well. In the beginning. So what do you have there for QRS? So it's, it's 0 0.06 milliseconds. Pretty small, but it's still considered a little bit of a normal It's not wide, that's what we're looking for. But you know, all three intervals. PRI, because it tells you if you got a heart block for a lot of them. QRS, you got to really recognize regularly. That's going to give you your bundle branches. And QTC is going to give you the dangerous arrhythmia. So look at all three intervals to document normal intervals. If you don't have a normal one, put the interval there, and what does it mean? Prolonged QTC is important. Sorry. First degree block, PRI, 320, like whatever it is. Okay? So, 480, 480 or less is normal QTC. <coughs> Okay. Less than 480 is normal for QTC. There are parameters for other things, but for today, we're going to use 480 as a normal QTC. So, you're starting to learn to document your rhythm, your rate, your axis, and now your intervals. What do your intervals show you? If they're normal, put normal intervals. If they're not, what does that indicate?
or so. I'll just keep working on these at some point, but just another minute so we can get on to the MI part. The juicy part. Now the one that's the VTAC, we're not going to have interval stuff that we're going to worry about there, right? So that was straight up just VTAC at a rate of whatever. Holy crap, and that's what you write. move on to our next portion. We're going to use these packets again in about 30 minutes and we're going to work on our MIs. Now why do I have you do your intervals next? Why do I care? So that's one thing that's correct. What's the big thing? What's your sheet say? Yeah, your bundle branch blocks, left bundle specifically, is not red. You don't, you cannot read your EKG like you normally do for all other EKGs. So you have to recognize a bundle branch before you start looking for your MI. Otherwise, you're calling heart alerts that are not. Because bundle branches often look like there's ST elevation, but there isn't that's part of the bundle. So if you don't recognize a bundle, you will call it in. I can, I can spot it a mile away when they call in. When they say, I have ST elevation of V1, V2, V3, uh, blah, 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 the first thing I ask when I'm on the radio, when they do get us, get us in there is, does the patient have a left bundle? And they say yes. And then I say, okay, we'll see you when you get here. Because what they're seeing is a natural change in the EKG because of a left bundle and they didn't recognize that. You're going to recognize that. And that's why you have to do intervals at this place. Can I read it normally or do I have to use a different criteria? Most of these are going to be normal criteria for now and then as the packets get going they get harder and harder and have more stuff in them. All right. So let's talk about reading for an MI. What am I looking for in an MI? ST segment elevation. Yeah, ST segment. And where does that begin? The J point. Yeah, and what is that? Uh, All right. <coughs> so, where the S wave and the T wave meet here, does this everybody agree? This is a J point. Yes. This corner of the world. We're looking for this point to either rise above the isoelectric or drop below the uh, isoelectric. Rising above the isoelectric means <coughs> infarction. It means I've got dying muscle. I'm having a heart attack. If I am depressed, I'm ischemic. I'm having. I need a little bit more oxygen to the area. I'm not tolerating whatever's happening. Okay. So elevation is infarct, and depression is ischemia. I measure that against what part of the EKG? Which is where. Where? On the back end. Yeah, the straight line. Line. So you want to go past the T way. Do you want anybody want to go this way towards this? Match it here. Because that's the mistake that's always made. This is not isoelectric. This is your AV node. Remember your electrical current we talked about? SA node, AV node, QRS. This is the middle of the cycle. This is not isoelectric. This is repolarization. This is flatline isoelectric waiting for the next impulse. So this J point gets measured to this and not before. That's another MI that gets called in all the time. That's pericarditis most of the time. We have 26 year olds coming in with heart alerts attached to them. I guarantee it's pericarditis. See it all the time. 26 year olds don't have MIs 99.7% of the time. There are those every blue moon, but for the most part, 25 year olds don't have them. So if you're calling an MI on that, it's either they've induced it with a cocaine overdose kind of thing, that could make sense. 
or you're reading your EKG wrong, and most of the time it's got your J-point matching up to something else. It is important to get a nice EKG so you can find the isoelectric line. Some of these, you can see the isoelectric line, you got a lot of base wave to your EKG because you can't settle the patient in. There's really no way to measure that. You got to get everything down on the paper. You got to get these people relaxed. So we're measuring to the isoelectric line, which is between the T and the next P, which is right there. <coughs> now, the next part of this is kind of really important. Our wave progression, this is V1 through V6, that's these leads. And again, these all have a particular look to them as well, and there's a reason for it. And again, let's talk about it. If my impulse starts right here, V1 and V2, my impulse starts right here, and it goes in this direction, what should V1 and V2 look like? They should be down because I'm going completely away from them. So a normal V1, V2 on 99% of the people, if everything's normal, should have a down deflection because I'm starting here, my impulse starts here, and it's going in that direction away from V1 and V2, but it's going directly to V5, V6. So those should be completely upright. So how the progression goes is these are down and these are up. And these guys in between are in between. That's what a progression should look like. So if you've got an EKG that's all going in one direction, that's another potential sign for VTAC or really bad placement. Okay? So the reason I want you to understand that is V1 should be down because it starts where the impulse starts and the impulse goes away from it. It should be down. And it all goes towards V6, which means it should almost always be up. One, if I were to split these three leads, one, two, three, and four, five, and six, if I split them down the middle, I have the right side of the myocardium, I have the left side of the myocardium. Keeping that in mind. So when I have a widened QRS, the first thing I have to do is go to V1 and see what it's doing. If V1 is down and my QRS is greater than 0.12, I can only be a left bundle branch block. If this is going in the right direction, it's going to be a left bundle branch block if my QRS is wide. If I go to V1 and it's <coughs> upright, I know where the problem is. I have a right bundle branch block because the right side of the heart has the complexes going in the wrong direction. So, V1 and V2 are down, V5 and V6 are up, and these two are, are uh, half and half. If I have a wide QRS, I go to V1, which should be down. If it is down, my bundle branch is where? Right. Left. If I, it is upright, it's a right bundle branch. We don't need stair wheels and blinking lights and thumbs flying around. Holy cow. That's how they teach it in a lot of classes. If you're turn your blinker on or side, I don't fucking know. What you need to know is what you're looking at and why you're looking at it. One should be down, and if it's not, you have your right bundle branch block. Okay? Does that make total sense? All right. Progression's important. A lot of it, it's on, it's just because when it goes funny, it's on wrong. Okay. Let's understand our coronary arteries for a minute. Because these MIs are going to make a big difference in what you see and you can almost guess before you put it on. So talking about the RCA as it comes off the, the, um, the uh, aorta here. You know, when the heart makes a contraction, the coronary arteries get the first blood supply. So coming out of the <coughs> aorta, the very first one that we run into is the RCA that literally comes down and wraps around the side of the heart, underneath the heart, and then some people have a branch that goes up behind the heart. It's a big J shape that then feeds to the back of the heart. That's the RCA. Big. If I block the RCA, all of my infarction is going to be down the, down the stream of the RCA. What kind of an MI is that? It's going to be an inferior MI. Because the RCA feeds the right side of the heart and the inferior wall, and 60% of the people it feeds the back of the wall as well. 
So if I ding my RCA, generally the RCA comes around like this and underneath and around the back. So these people will have ischemia occurring down here. This is the inferior portion of the heart. This also runs alongside the heart. There's this really cool thing right here called the vagus nerve that when the heart is really bothered, it is stimulated. And when people have an infarct under here, their symptoms are more belly <coughs> and chest. So they have a lot of belly discomfort, epigastric discomfort, a lot of nausea, and their, their most common rhythm they're in is bradycardia. A for the, for the vagus nerve being stimulated. So a lot of those people, if you give them Zofran during their MI, their heart rate comes up. And the other interesting thing about this is in 60% of the people, their SA node is fed by this artery. So if I clot off this artery and I'm not feeding the SA node and the SA node dies, who picks up the heart rate from there? And what's its intrinsic rate? So when you have a 36-year-old man sitting at a construction site who's puking into a bucket, who's gray, who's pale, who's sweaty, who has no radial pulses, or, or has radial pulses and it's at a rate of 48, you're going to be applying an EKG and you're instantly already thinking, this is an inferior wall of mine. Be surprised if it's not, but I'm pretty sure you'll be right 85% of the time. They all look the same. It's going by the vagus nerve. It's all part of the innervation of the diaphragm. People get really nauseated with it. They do um, ding their SA node a lot, so they end up in blocks, the greater part of rhythms. That's their arrhythmia that they get into. And because the RCA goes right by that right ventricle, and it does feed the right ventricle, depending on how high up the artery is dinged, you know, if the clot is way down here, the right ventricle is probably not going to be affected. But if the clot is way up top, it's going to take out the whole right ventricle and the whole interior in, inferior wall. So this is the MI. In order to see this side of the heart, you have to do an EKG on this side. Does that make sense? <coughs> All right. With an inferior wall MI, it's the safest one to have. If you have to have one, pick that. Why do we do a P4R? Somebody else besides him? Why? What is it? So why do I care? Why do I care that I see the right side of the heart? Why do I care? That's for the damages. It changes your treatment. It does? What? What do you mean? Why? Yeah, because that whole right ventricle is the primer to the pump. If the pump's getting nothing, what's coming out the other end? Nothing. So if you give these people nitro and you can't get blood to the right side of the heart because you've blown their blood pressure, you can harm them uh or kill them. I want to make you feel bad, <laughs> but you can. So nitro in an inferior wall is appropriate <coughs> as long as they have a lot of blood pressure and their right, right, right side of the heart is not involved. When the right side, of heart, right side of the heart is not involved, these people need more fluids than you can give them. So if you can get a big line and put your normal saline up and put it on an infuser bag, if you can get a liter or two in them, they're better off. So in the cath lab, my last year as a nurse while in medical school before I finished and became a physician. I worked in a cath lab for a year and a half. And it was really cool to see these people do six to eight liters before they get their blood pressure back. That's a true priming of the pump. So trust me, a little 500 cc's ain't going to do it. And these people don't get into congestive heart failure because they can't even get the blood to the lungs. It doesn't come in and it doesn't go. So you know, 500, I'm going to listen to the lungs, 500, listen to the lungs. For what? They don't go into failure. The problem is I can't get it from the left side and from the feet into the heart. It's not even going to the lungs, so i got to prime them. <coughs> give these people fluids and be careful with your nitro. It's not don't give it, it's called be careful. If they have a pressure of 200 over 100 in an inferior wall of mine, they can get nitro. They can get one, see how they do, get them their fluids, get your V4R going, because nitro is important along with the aspirin. But you got a borderline pressure, 140s, 130s, 120s, I wouldn't go there if I were you. You're asking for it. You might get lucky and give it and not have a problem, and then you'll walk around going, she's fucking know what she's talking about. 
I can write you all the time. I haven't hurt anybody. You will, and you'll feel bad because you'll realize that you know every patient is different, and we try not to say no nitro in IMIs because some people teach it that way. No nitro in inferior wall. I'm not saying that. I'm saying nitro is okay for a subset, but you have to be careful. You have to know what you're doing. Does that make sense? Okay. That's how IMIs present. Usually belly pain, usually nauseated, usually bradycardic, usually pretty sick, and they can code easily, as we know. Where are you? I had one the other night, an inferior wall that coded, and because they follow my 10 important rules, they had the pads on already, went boom, shock, and he was alive. And he's going home today, he's doing great. So it happens, but you gotta be ready for it, and you're aware. Okay. <coughs> what? Would you prefer a paste in some of these? I, I don't, unless you get into trouble. So pacing in the field. No, not nitro paste. Oh, no. No, nitro paste takes, especially if, again, how do you put nitro paste on people? We've already talked about this. Put it on the paper, you pick your amount, follow the little ruler, and then you fold it and get it all over the whole paper and put it on. The more surface area, the more absorption you get. But it takes a little bit longer than just getting the nitro under the tongue. The one good thing about paste is that if you get into trouble, you take it off and wipe it off, and you're not getting the constant 400 mics. But I personally don't. I think the nitro is totally fine in this particular case, the oral. Okay, the other one that's really important, if the inferior, if the RCA doesn't feed the back of the heart on some of these people, a lot of times the circumflex, the one that comes around the top by the lateral leads, feeds a lot of people's posterior wall. So when I say that, what's important to understand is sometimes you'll have an EKG that shows ST depression right here. And the first question you say to yourself is, oh, there's depression in the septum. Where is the elevation? What's the mirror of the front, the, the back. back? So the same crew that put that <coughs> last code in that's going home, that went home yesterday, brought a code in earlier in the morning with a posterior mic, and cardiology wouldn't believe us. It was frustrating. Yeah, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we called it a heart alert. They called it, they were right on. We called the heart alert. He had ST depression, V1, V2, V3, V4. The whole backside of his heart was being infarcted. And the fellow came in, he's like, ah. He goes to the guy, he goes like this, he goes. And the guy goes, ow, because most people's sterns are tender anyway. He goes, oh, that's, uh, that's a reproducible pain. <laughs> we all looked at each other and were like, what? <laughs> so I'm arguing with the attending who's listening to his fellow who says this is an MI. And we're all looking at each other going, what? So he goes upstairs and his first troponin's negative, which they always are. How much, how much time do you have for pain? An hour? What was it? It was like less than an hour. So the troponin is going to be negative. He went upstairs, he got a second troponin, it was up to 24, and his third one went to 160. So they had to take him to the cath lab then. What was it like four hours later? Six hours later. Six hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. So yeah. posterior MI, yeah. they did a great job. They called it right from the beginning, and they were right on. So posterior MIs are found on the anterior EKG looking at V1 and V2. If it's elevated in V1 and V2, it's a septal MI. If it's depressed, it's a posterior MI. Okay? A lot of times when leads <coughs> 1 and L are elevated, that's usually a sign of a posterior MI because 1 and L belong to the circumflex. All right. Here's the next big one. This is really all you need to know. LAD, this is an old video thing, I have to change it. But the LAD, this main artery, that's just the main artery that comes down and basically drops right down the front of the heart. LAD, right over the biggest <coughs> part of the left ventricle. <coughs> the most anterior portion of the left ventricle, LAD. What leads are staring at the LAD right here? V3 and V4. Those are responsible for the anterior wall. So again, understanding why your things are placed the way they are. V1 and V2 are the septum. V3 and V4 look at the 
anterior wall. Five and six looks at the lateral wall. The anterior wall is the worst um, MI to have, right? What kind of an MI is that? Widowmaker. They call it the Widowmaker because that's what it is. You have to have V3 and V4 involved. Those are the contiguous leads that go with it. They can bleed over to two and five, but three and four have to be there. <coughs> and their arrhythmia is known, their most common arrhythmia in an anterior MI is what? Tachycardia. Why? It's physiological. Why? Think about your physiology. It's dying. Yeah, so we're trying to compensate, right? The heart, the body wants to see five liters a minute. And all of a sudden the pump is now failing. It's not putting out five liters. Whether it's bleeding into the street or it's having an MI, the body says, hey, pick up the pace. I need some, uh, I need five liters a minute. So the first response of the LAD is to increase the rate to get the cardiac output. This is our cardiac output, so they will have tachy arrhythmias. These people will go tachy into VTAC into VFib and die. This is the worst MI. If you have this, you have a 60% mortality just having the MI. If you have no blood pressure, you have an 80% mortality. And if you go into <coughs> heart failure, you have 90% mortality. It is the worst MI. So don't pick it. That's why I said pick the inferior men when you pick yours. Okay? So you're being, you've got to be very aware of the rhythms that are going to come with this because the medications you pick are going to play into this. Anterior wall MIs get into cardiogenic shock really easily. Your test question wants you to hang dopamine for cardiogenic shock. We don't use dopamine anymore. But for your paperwork and for your test, you have to say dopamine. Because the downside of dopamine is tachycardia. So you add a medication like that that has more tachy arrhythmias than it does blood pressure effect, you're going to have trouble with, with uh, dopamine on cardiogenic shock. It's a second line, not a first line. But for your book, you have to say it's the first line. Because they're, like I said, they're five years behind. Okay? All right. <laughs> Huh? <coughs> yeah, this, uh, unfortunately, medicine's moving so fast, and this is what I'm having with my departments. We're just constantly updating, updating, updating. Because if you guys stay, like even ACLS, ACLS is due for their next one coming out in 2020. So they're already four and a half years behind, and those, when those came out, were five years behind. So we're constantly, you have to stay more current. And that's why I like Dr. Inman and myself, who are the medical directors around here, we're constantly pushing people to learn new material and stop hanging on to old terms and old stuff. Because we know through lots of studies, a lot of the stuff we've been doing as paramedics over the years are either not helpful or harmful. So my department's hang Epi Drip a lot. Epi Drip, the dirty drip, and the push dose Epi is more important to understand than dopamine. You still have to know dopamine because you still need a second presser sometimes. So we don't use it first. Um, the county probably still does because you guys still are in the process of updating a lot of stuff. And Haley will get you there. Never seen it. Mm -hmm. Used it what? Either. No, I know. That was a problem when I got here in 2014. The first call I went on, the patient needed some kind of a presser. When I asked them, they definitely didn't know about Epidrip. So I said, well, why don't you get your dopamine out? I thought they were all going to have a stroke. They're like, we haven't used dopamine in 10 years. I'm thinking, Oh my God, you people are killing me. That's the bag in the bottom. <laughs> yeah, that's scary. And um, yes, I know you guys don't use it a lot. And it's, I think Haley will get you there eventually. She's a great medical director. And you guys will, as long as you follow her lead, you're going to do some good work. All right, so how do we go about reading an EKG? The important thing to understand is that we take our J point and we line it up to the isoelectric line behind it. Now, I read mine the same every way, every single time. For today's purposes, follow my lead, and then later on, if you want to do your own thing, do your own thing. But for today's purposes, we're going to read in order. I read in order of most common 
to the most dangerous, and then the other stuff. So when I take an EKG, I start with rate and rhythm, rate is 62, I have P waves everywhere, so I have a sinus Brady, I have an on right, I can see I have a physiological left, so I put normal, I look at my intervals, my intervals are all normal, I got 406, I got 104, I got 13.13, so all my intervals are normal, I can then read my EKG, so now I'm looking for ST elevation, because that's the stuff that's going to kill somebody. The first place I go is my inferior wall because it's the most common. It is the most common. <coughs> so I immediately go to the inferior leads, which we said are leads 2, leads 3, AVF. I go 2, 3, and AVF. When they say 1 millimeter in two contiguous leads, you only need it in two of the three or two of the four or in both, depending on what you're looking at. Okay? In this case, we have two, three, and ABF. And when I look over here, I go, J point, I don't have elevation. J point, that's not elevation, that's depression. That's depression. This is not an inferior wall of mine. I then go from inferior to anterior. I go to V3, J point, line it up with my isoelectric, no elevation. V4, no elevation. This is not an anterior MI. Then I go to my four lateral leads. I start over here at one. J point, hmm, four millimeter ST elevation. AVL, one and L are over here. Four millimeter ST elevation. V5, no elevation. V6, no elevation. So far I have a lateral MI. But I gotta finish. I need septal leads. V1, oh well, they can't do it. V1, no elevation. V2, no elevation. When I'm done, all of my leads, I then say, what kind of an MI is this? This is a high lateral wall MI. High lateral wall. Now, let's talk about people talk about what are the reciprocal changes? Well, where's the mirror image? Again, thinking about it, where's 1 and L? Point to, point to me with your hand. Where's 1 and L? 1 and L is right here, right? Yeah. If I were to make a mirror of that, where's my mirror? Down at the bottom. Inferior. inferior. Does my inferior show depression? <coughs> yeah. So I have a lateral wall MI with reciprocal changes that match the MI. So I would then write this as, here we are. I have a STEMI, clearly can call it that. I have a sinus Brady at, or sinus rhythm I said, right? Sinus rhythm at 62 with a normal axis, normal intervals, with ST, oh, I should say it this way, four millimeter, four millimeter ST elevation, lead one, ABL. That's all you need. If you want to put reciprocal in 2, 3, and ABF, you can. But this explains it all. I have a STEMI. I have a rate, I have a rhythm, I have a normal axis, normal intervals, and I have 4 millimeter ST elevation, and this is where I found it. That's a perfect write up on your uh, EKG. Perfect. Does this make sense? Yes? You have to have the reciprocal change on the no. EKG to call it STEMI. You don't. It's just that it's a it's on the page and a lot of people ask like why does this happen? Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Just like your posteriors. I have ST depression right here. If I did a posterior, I'd have ST elevation there. Where would I expect the depression in the front? That's what I see. Anterior walls. Sometimes you'll have big anterior wall MIs, and the reason that that's happening is you have your reciprocal. And you'll see in the back of the heart there'll be all kinds of ST depression. Why is that? Because this particular person's LAD folds underneath into the back. Everybody's backside is, is um, connected to a different artery. Some people it's all RCA, some people it's circumflex, some people it's a really long um, LAD. My sister has no RCA at all. Her entire heart is fed by her left um, artery, her left LAD. She's got branches everywhere. She has no RCA at all. Can you run into the issue?
issue of not being able to discern where the infarct is versus what's reciprocal and confused? No, we won't. <coughs> and we're going to do we're going to do a million of these. You're getting tired of looking at them. Let's look at our next one. So, with that being said, let's walk through this one really slowly. Again, all the way from the beginning. And then once we get through these 10 that are here, you're going to take your brains and go to lunch and kind of empty out. And then you're going to come back and we're going to do, I have 40 of them, we're going to go through quickly. And then I'm going to touch bundle branch blocks, which is more than you guys will need for at least the biggest part of your practice. And then I'm going to give you a thing for a Scarbosa to go home with, and you will go home. But we'll get the MIs down, you should be able to get this without a problem. So let's do our first one. We have heart rate of 107. So the base rhythm is sinus tack. Great. AVR properly placed. <coughs> My axis is physiological left. Therefore, it's normal. Okay. Let's begin looking for our and our intervals. We have normal intervals. QRS 0.08. QTC 400. PRI, 0.13, so we're in good shape. All intervals, normal. So we can read our EKG normal. Let's start. Inferior wall, what is it? <coughs> okay. I have J point isoelectric. J point isoelectric. J point isoelectric. Okay, it's not an inferior. Where's the anterior? Three and four. V3 and V4. These two right here in the front, staring at the front wall. I have J point, here's our isoelectric. That's like six or seven millimeters. Let's look over here. All right, so we have at least an anterior wall. What else is going on? Let's keep going. Let's look at our full lateral wall. Lateral is what? So do we have some in one? Yeah, we do. One millimeter. Do we have one in L? We have one or a half. Yes. Let's come to five. Yes. Yes. Do we have one in six? Slightly. Not really. So, so far we have anterior and lateral. And let's just fix our uh, septal. Do I have anything here? No. Do I have anything here? Yes. So this is really the cool thing. What's this uh, um, MI called? Anterior MI with septal and lateral involvement. That's exactly, you can say it that way, or you can call it anterior lateral with septal involvement, or anterior septal with lateral involvement. But you're recognizing that the anterior wall is dinged, and it's spreading out to number two and number five, as well as the high lateral portion over here. So you call the MI by an inferior, or an anterior, or a septal, or a lateral, and then you add the other stuff that you see on there. So this is an anterior lateral with septal involvement, anterior septal with lateral involvement. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's do it else. Okay, who wants to do this one? Somebody walk me through it. All right, 55. Let's see, it's placed right. PCC. It's a little older. 43. Others on the one line. Okay. So it's a junctional. So it says a PR interval is zero. So there's no P waves. So it's a junctional rhythm. This is a junctional rhythm at 55. Okay. Um, normal axis. Okay. And then normal intervals, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, you got about 2-3 ABS. So you got about maybe a 1 millimeter elevation in two, maybe a two millimeter elevation in three, one, mm -hmm. and maybe a, so you got some inferior involvement. Okay. Three, four. Not three, four. I'm sorry, B, four, five. No, you're right. It's, three, get, three, you know, because this is three, B3. and this is B3. They're in different places. Uh, you got some depression. Okay. B3. B3 is depression. B4. Is depression? Okay. Um, and then your high lateral. Yeah. It's good. It's good. Maybe. Um, maybe. Well, 
that's depression, not elevation. Okay. Okay, let's do our five and six. Those are normal. Okay. Acceptable. B1, maybe some depression area. B2, yeah, depression definitely. You see the depression all the way through. You're having depression throughout this whole area. <coughs> so where will the elevation be? So what's in your inferior? Right, so we have an inferior wall with posterior, posterior. The posterior involvement. If you were to put that all on, you would have you would have inferior elevation and posterior elevation. These are all connected from one RCA. So this is an inferior MI with posterior involvement because I got depression in the front, which means I got elevation in the back. So this is an inferior main MI is an inferior with posterior involvement. This is one that you would go over to a V4R. Now, interestingly, if V4 looks like this. When I move it from here to there, everything's going in this way. V4R, this is how most people should be able to tell that they did a V4R without even writing on it, because this will come out as being upside down. And if you're looking, looking at this, you'll be looking for ST elevation, which means you have a positive V4R. If you have a V4R that comes out and looks normal, then there's no ST elevation in V4R. So but it will look exactly opposite of what this is when you move from here to there. So that one would be a positive. It may. We don't know because we didn't do it. Okay, inferior wall with posterior involvement. Good job. Is anybody lost yet? I mean, some people I know are bored to death, but some of you, I just want to be sure everybody is following me. Okay. All right, this one, somebody did a posterior MI. They actually put on V7, V8, V9. But if you want to correlate it, I have it's basically similar to the one before, ST depression, ST depression, ST depression. So they took the leads and put them on the back, and I have ST elevation on the back. So I just to prove to you that when you're depressed in the front, you're elevated in the back. You don't need these to know what this is. So if you're getting fancy, don't waste the patient's time. All right? I and mean, we did this because what kind of an MI is this? Inferior, 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 inferior MI posterior, and posterior involvement. involvement. That's why we did the posterior leads. I wouldn't have bothered. I would have just done V4R. But this just helps the concept of making you understand that when this looks like this, they look like this from the back. Does that make sense? Okay. I only have a couple more, and then we'll give you guys a break because I don't want your brains exploding all over the room. Somebody else want to try this one? Okay, back row. Somebody in the back row, come on. Help me out. Stay in your order. I don't care who, one of you guys back there needs to talk. If you need to come closer, you can. Okay. So what makes it, what's the rhythm? So we have a sinus tack at a rate of 110. What do we do next? ABR is normal, so I can go ahead and read. What's my axis? Up, up, up. So I have a normal axis. And then I go to my intervals. Are all my intervals normal? 0 0.14, 0 0.10, 389. So I have normal intervals. That's my next line. And then we start reading. 3 ABF. And again, count your millimeters. We're going to say 3, 4, 5 millimeters, whatever. Just take the biggest one and use that one. So we're going to have 5 millimeter ST elevation in 2, 3 ABF. Okay. Your anterior. Which is what? V3, V4. V3, V4. You got depression. Okay. In both. Okay. Uh, geolateral, 1, ABL, 5, one. 6. ABL. Yeah, depression, depression. Oh. Elevation, elevation. Okay. Uh, you do your septal. Yep. You got V1, V2, get yeah, depression and all those. All right, so what do we want to call this? Or, uh, it's, there's three things going on. Just put, put it together. Sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, inferior, uh, posterior, uh, uh, anterior. You could do in, uh, inferior, posterior. You'd be correct. Okay. With? Uh, lateral and Correct. Septal. 
my, not my, septal, this is posterior. My, my, so you have inferior posterior MI with lateral involvement. How else could you say this? Inferior lateral. Inferolateral with posterior involvement. They would both be correct. So the main part of the MI is what's the main wall and then what else is involved. Perfect. That was you perfect. Said, yeah, it's inferior or you're saying main wall. Yes. But you got innovation Then inferior is your main wall. Because it's just two three, two three. It's just how that it's, uh, it's the the two main MIs we have are inferiors and, and anteriors. Those are the most common. Ninety-seven percent of the time, it's those are your MI, MIs. And then you have these other smaller ones. You can have a lateral by itself or a lateral posterior because that's a farther down a farther artery generally, but lateral usually is by itself. Septal is often by itself if it's a, if it's a single MI, but septal usually follows the anterior. It's the nomenclature that the that medicine has chosen. So you'd pick an anterior, an inferior, or an anterior, <coughs> add stuff to them. All right. I have a couple more. Oh, this was the thing I was trying to explain to you about the VTAC. Right, so VTAC starts here at the bottom, it stimulates and it depolarizes backwards. Clearly, the electricity is going in the wrong direction. These will have a negative deflection, and that will be a positive deflection, which will then show up on your, your um, EKG. So here's our point, here's our point, here's our point. I don't like this picture as well, and at some point I'll get this changed out, but that's how you're looking at This is a pathological axis that says we're in that this corner of the world. So that's why 12 leads. Understanding how to read them and staying in order is going to save your butt. You said the exact AVR would be upright because we're going towards AVR. And our 1, 2, and 3, which are out here, we're going away from them. Okay? Alright, do we have questions before you go to lunch? Questions? So you're going to have lunch, you'll think about it. When you come back, I have 40 of these to read. We'll go through the room. We're going to add to our packets to see how you do with the packets. Some of these are normal, some of them are not. You have three packets that you're going to go home, home with for homework. They have about 14 or 15 EKGs each. Are you going to do this the same way? You're going to write it out like it's a run report. Just following this thing. And we're going to try to wrap up with bundle branches so you at least get that piece. All right, and that should be enough. Your brain should be cooked by then. Okay. All right, go to lunch. Why don't you come back about? Uh, what do you want? 12, 15, 12, 30. 12, 30. 12, 30. All right, get out. <laughs> <laughs> Did everybody sign the morning roster? <laughs>